All right, and back with chapter 10. Chapter 9 uh, found us at Christmas time, and Jim, our, our uh, scout, in a fight because um, someone had told her that uh, her dad was a nigger lover and that he was uh, defending a Negro man, and that uh, then he, she heard again at Christmas dinner from her old cousin, and so she confronts Atticus, and um, she gets in trouble for cussing by her Uncle Jack, and uh, finds out why she shouldn't use words like the N-word, nigger, and why... Um, she shouldn't cuss. Right. So anyway, on to chapter 10. Atticus was feeble. He was nearly 50. When Jim and I asked him why he was so old, he said he got started late, which we felt reflected upon his abilities and manliness. He was much older than the parents of our school contemporaries, and there is nothing Jim or I could say about him when our classmates said, My father, Jim, was football crazy. Atticus was never too tired to play keep away, but when Jim wanted to tackle him, Atticus would say, I'm too old for that, son. Our father didn't do anything. He worked in an office, not in a drugstore. Atticus did not drive a dump truck for the county. He was not the sheriff. He did not farm, work in a garage, or do anything that could possibly arouse the admiration of anyone. Besides that, he wore glasses. He was nearly blind in his left eye, and said left eyes were the tribal curse of the finches. Whenever he wanted to see something well, he turned his head and looked from his right eye. He did not do things our schoolmate fathers did. He never went hunting. He did not play poker or fish or drink or smoke. He sat in the living room and read. With these attributes, however, he would not remain as inconspicuous as we wished him to that year. The school buzz would talk about him defending Tom Robinson, none of which was complimentary. After my bout with Cecil Jacobs, when I committed myself to a policy of cowardice, word got around that Scout Finch wouldn't fight anymore. Her daddy wouldn't let her. This was not entirely correct. I wouldn't fight publicly for Atticus, but the family was private ground. I would fight anyone from a third cousin upwards to the now. Francis Hancock, for example, knew that. When he gave us our air rifles, Atticus wouldn't teach us to shoot. Uncle Jack instructed us in the rudiments thereof and said Atticus wasn't interested in guns. Atticus said to Jim one day, I'd rather you shoot at tin cans in the backyard, but I know you're going to go after birds. Shoot all the blue jays you want if you can hit them, but remember it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. There was the only time I ever heard Atticus say it was a sin to do something, and I asked Miss Maudie about it. Your father's right, she said. Mockingbirds don't do one thing but make music for us to enjoy. They don't eat people's gardens, don't nest in corn cribs. They don't do one thing but sing their hearts out for us, and that's why it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. Miss Maudie, this is an old neighborhood, ain't it? Been here longer than the town? No, I mean the folks... On our street are all old. Jim and me's the only children around here. Mrs. Dubose is close to a hundred, and Miss Rachel's old, and so are you and Atticus. Well, I don't call fifty very old, said Miss Monty to me. <laughs> Not being wheeled around yet, am I? Neither's your father. But I must say, Providence was kind enough to <laughs> burn down that old mausoleum of mine. I'm too old to keep it up. Maybe you're right, Jim and me. This is a settled neighborhood. You've never been around young folks much, have you? I'm going to make a Come on up. Come on. Hurry up. Come on, jump. Jump up here. I can't pick you up, Fatty. Come on. <laughs> jump up here. Come on. Jump. Sorry about that. Okay, um, okay, she says, yes, Jean Louise, Jean Louise, you're right, this is a settled neighborhood, you've never been around young folks much, have you? Yes, I'm at school, 
I mean young grown-ups. You're lucky, you know. You and Jim have the benefit of your father's age. If your father was 30, you'd find life quite different. I sure would. Atticus can't do anything. Excuse me. You'd be surprised at Miss Maudie. There's a life in him yet. Well, what can he do? Well, he can make somebody's will so airtight. Can't nobody meddle with it. Shoot. Well, did you know he's the best checker player in this town? Why, down at the landing when we were coming up, Atticus Finch could beat everybody on both sides of the river. Good Lord, Miss Monty. Jim and me beat him all the time. Well, it's about time you found out. It's because he lets you. Did you know he can play a Jew's harp? This modest accomplishment served me to make me even more ashamed of him. Well, she said. Well, what, Miss Monty? Well, nothing. Nothing. It seems with all that you'd be proud of him. Can er can everybody play a Jew's harp? Now keep me out of, of the way of the carpenters. You'd better go home. I'll be in my azaleas and I can't watch you. Plank might hit you in the head. I went to the backyard and found Jim plugging away at a tin can, which seems stupid with all the blue jays around. Come here. Come here. Um, where'd it go? Which seems stupid with all the blue jays around. I returned to the front yard and busied myself for two hours erecting a complicated breastwork at the side of the porch, consisting of a tire, an orange crate, the laundry hamper, the porch chairs, and a small U.S. flag Jam gave me from a popcorn box. When Atticus came home to dinner, he found me crouched down, aiming across the street. What are you shooting at? Miss Maudie's rear end. Atticus turned and saw my generous target bending over her bushes. He pushed his hat to the back of his head and across the street. Maudie, he called. I thought I'd better warn you. You're in considerable peril. Miss Maudie straightened up and looked toward me. She said, Atticus, you are a devil from hell. When Atticus returned, he told me to break camp. Don't you ever let me catch you pointing that gun at anybody again, he said. I wish my father was a devil from hell. I sounded out Calpurnia on the subject. Mr. Finch? Why, he can do lots of things, she said. Like what, I asked. Calpurnia scratched her head. Well, I don't rightly know, she said. Jim underlined it when he asked Atticus if he was going out for the Methodist, and Atticus said he'd break his neck if he did. He was just too old for that sort of thing. The Methodists were trying to pay off their church mortgage and had challenged the Baptists to a game of touch football. Everybody in town's father was playing, it seemed, except Dad Atticus. Jim said he didn't even want to go, but he was unable to resist football in any form, and he stood gloomily on the sidelines with Atticus and me watching Cecil Jacobs' father make touchdowns for the Baptists. One Saturday, Jim and I decided to go exploring with our air rifles to see if we could find a rabbit or a squirrel. We had gone about 500 yards beyond the Radley place when I noticed Jim squinting at something down the street. He had turned his head on to one side and was looking out of the corner of his eye. What you looking at? That old dog down yonder, he said. That's old Tim Johnson, ain't it? Yeah. Tim Johnson was the property of Mr. Harry Johnson, who drove the mobile bus and lived on the southern edge of town. Tim was a liver-colored bird dog, the pet of Maycomb. What's he doing? I don't know, Scout. We better go home. Ah, oh, Jim, it's February. I don't care. I'm going to tell Cal. We raced home and ran to the kitchen. Cal, said Jim, can you come down the sidewalk a minute? What for, Jim? I can't come down the sidewalk every time you want me. There's something wrong with an old dog down yonder. Cal turned me aside. I can't wrap up any dog foot now. There's some gauze in the bathroom. Go get it and do it yourself. Jim shook his head. He's sick, Cal. Something's wrong with him. What are you doing? Trying to catch his tail? No, he's doing like this. Jim gulped like a goldfish, hunched his shoulders, and twitched his torso. He's going like that, only not like he means to. Are you telling me a story, Jim Finch? Cal Pernia's voice hardened. No, Cal, I swear I'm not. Was he running? No, he's just moseying along, so slow you can't hardly tell it. He's coming this way. Calpurnia rinsed her hands and followed Jim into the yard. I don't see any dogs, she said. She followed us beyond the Radley place and looked where Jim pointed. 
Tim Johnson was not much more than a speck in the distance, but he was closer to us. He walked erratically as if his right legs were shorter than his left legs. He reminded me of a car stuck in a sand bed. He's gone all lopsided, said Jim. Calpurnia stared and then grabbed us by the shoulders and ran us home. She shut the wood door behind us, went to the telephone and shouted, Give me Mr. Finch's office. Mr. Finch, she shouted, this is Cal. I swear to God, there's a mad dog down the street a piece. He's coming this way. Yes, sir. He's Miss, Mr. Finch, I declare he is old Tim Johnson. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. She hung up and shook her head when we tried to ask her what Atticus had said. She rattled the telephone hook and said, Miss Eula May, now, ma'am, I'm through talking to Mr. Finch. Please don't con connect me no more. Listen, Miss Eula May, can you call Miss Rachel and Miss Stephanie Crawford and whoever's got a phone on this street and tell them a mad dog's coming? Please, ma'am. Calpurnia listened. I know it's February, Miss Eula May, but I know a mad dog when I see one. Please, ma'am, hurry. Calpurnia asked Jim, Radley's got a phone? Jim looked in the book and said, No, they won't come out anyway, Cal. I don't care. I'm going to tell them. She ran to the front porch. Jim and I at her heels. You stay in the house, she yelled. Calpurnia's message had been received by the neighborhood. Every wood door within our range of vision was closed tight. We saw no trace of Tim Johnson. We watched Calpurnia running toward the Radley place, holding her skirt and apron above her knees. She went up to the front steps and banged on the door. She got no answer and she shouted, Mr. Nathan, Mr. Arthur, mad dog's coming, mad dog's coming. She's supposed to go around in the back, I said. Jim shook his head. Don't make any difference now, he said. Calpurnia pounded on the door in vain. No one acknowledged her warning and no one seemed to have even heard it. As Calpurnia sprinted to the back porch, a black Ford swung into the driveway. Atticus and Mr. Heck Tate got out. Mr. Heck Tate was the sheriff of Macon County. He was tall as Atticus, but thinner. He was long-nosed, wore boots with shiny metal eye holes, boot pants, and a lumber jacket. His belt had a row of bullets sticking in it. He carried a heavy rifle. When he and Atticus reached the porch, Jim opened the door. Stay inside, son, said Atticus. Where is it, Cal? He ought to be here by now, said Cal, pointing point down the street. Not running, is he, said Mr. Tate. No, sir, he's in the twitching stage, Mr. Heck. Should we go after him, Heck? asked Atticus. We better wait, Mr. Finch. They usually go in a straight line, but you never can tell. He might follow the curve. Hope he does, or he'll go straight in the Radley backyard. Let's wait a minute. Don't think he'll get in the Radley yard, said Atticus. Fence will stop him. He'll probably follow the road. I thought mad dogs foamed at the mouth, galloped, leaped, and lunged at throats, and I thought they did in August. Had Tim Johnson behaved thus, I would have been less frightened. Nothing is more deadly than a deserted waiting street. The trees, the trees were still, the mockingbirds went silent, and the carpenters at Miss Maudie's house had vanished. I heard Mr. Tate sniff and then blow his nose. I saw him shift his gun to the crick of his arm. I saw Miss Stephanie Crawford's face framed in the glass window of her front door. Miss Maudie appeared and stood beside her. Atticus put his foot on the rung of a chair and rubbed his hand slowly down the side of his thigh. There he is, he said softly. Tim Johnson came into sight, walking dazedly in the inner rim of the curve parallel to the Radley house. Look at him, whispered Jim. Mr. Heck said they walk in a straight line. He can't even stay in the road. He looks more sick than anything, he said. Let anything get in front of him and he'll come straight at it. Mr. Tate put his hand to his forehead and leaned forward. Oh, he's got it all right, Mr. Finch. Tim Johnson was advancing at a snail's pace, but he was not playing or sniffing at foliage. He seemed dedicated to one course and motivated by an invisible force that was inching him right towards us. We could see him shiver like a horse shedding flies. His jaw opened and shut. He was a list, but he was being pulled gradually towards us. Oh, he's looking for a place to die, said Jim. Mr. Tate turned around. He's far from dead, Jim. He hasn't even got started yet. Tim Johnson reached the side street that ran in front of the Radley place, and what remained of his poor mind made him pause and seem to consider which road he would take. He made a few hesitant steps and stopped in front of the Radley gate and then turned to right, tried to turn right but was having difficulty. 
Atticus said, he's within range, heck. You better get him before he goes down the side street. Lord knows who's around that corner. Go inside, Cal. Cal Perny opened the screen door, latched it behind her, and then unlatched it and held onto the hook. She tried to block Jam and me with her body, but we looked out from beneath her arms. Take him, Mr. Finch. Mr. Tate handed the rifle to Atticus. Jem and I nearly fainted. Don't waste time, Hank, said Atticus. Go on. Mr. Finch, this is a one-shot job. Atticus shook his head vehemently. Don't just stand there, heck. He won't wait all day for you. For God's sake, Mr. Finch, look where he is. Miss and you'll go straight into the rabbit's house. I can't shoot that well, and you know it. I haven't shot a gun in 30 years. Mr. St Mr. Tate almost threw the rifle at Atticus. I'd feel mighty comfortable if you did now, he said. In a fog, Jim and I watched our father take the gun and walk out into the middle of the street. He walked quickly, but I thought he moved like an underwater swimmer. Time had slowed to a nauseated crawl. <coughs> when Atticus raised his glasses, Calpurnia murmured, Oh, sweet Jesus, help him, and put her hands to her cheeks. Atticus pushed his glasses to his forehead. They slipped down, and he dropped them in the street. In the silence, I heard them crack. Atticus rubbed his eyes and chin, and we saw him blink hard. In front of the Radley gate, Tim Johnson had made up what was left of his mind. He had finally turned himself round to pursue his original course up our street. He made two steps forward and then stopped and raised his head. We saw his body go rigid. With movements so swift they seemed simultaneous, Atticus' hand yanked a ball tip lever as he brought the gun to his shoulder. The rifle cracked and Tim Johnson leaped, flopped over, and crumpled on the sidewalk in a brown and white heap. He didn't even know what hit him. Mr. Tate jumped off the porch and ran to the Radley place. He stopped in front of the dog, squatted, turned around, and tapped his finger on his forehead above his left eye. You were a little to the right, Mr. Finch, he called. Always was, answered Atticus, but had my druthers eye to take a shotgun. He stooped and picked up his glasses, ground the broken lens to powder under his heel, and went to Mr. Tate and stood looking down at Tim Johnson. Doors opened one by one and the neighborhood slowly came alive. Miss Maudie walked down the steps with Miss Stephanie Crawford. Jim was just paralyzed. I pinched him to get him moving, but when Atticus saw us coming, he called, Stay where you are. When Mr. Tate and Atticus returned to the yard, Mr. Tate was smiling. I'll have Zebo collect him, he said. You haven't forgot much, Mr. Finch. They say it never leaves you. Atticus was silent. Atticus, said Jim. Yes. Oh, nothing, said Jim. I saw that one shot Finch. Atticus wheeled round and faced Miss Motty. They looked at one another without saying anything, and Atticus got into the sheriff's car. Come here, he said to Jim. And don't you go near that dog, you understand me? Don't go near him. He's just as dangerous dead as he is alive. Yes, sir, said Jim. Atticus? What, son? Oh, nothing. What's the matter with you, boy? Can't you talk? Said Mr. Tate, grinning at Jim. Didn't you know your daddy's a hush heck? Said Atticus. Let's go back to town. When they drove away, Jim and I went to Miss Stephanie's front steps. We sat waiting for Zebo to arrive in the garbage truck. Jim sat in numb confusion. And Miss Stephanie said, Uh, uh, who do you thought a mad dog in February? Maybe he wasn't mad. Maybe maybe he's just crazy. I'd hate to see Harry Johnson's face when he gets him from the mobile run and finds out a Finch has shot a dog. That he was just full of fleas from somewhere. Miss Maudie said Miss Stephanie would be singing a different tune if Tim Johnson was still coming up the street. That, that they'd find out soon enough they'd send his head off to Montgomery. Jim became vaguely articulate. Did you see him, Scout? Did you see him just standing there? And all of a sudden he just relaxed all over and looked like that gun was a part of him. And he did it so quick, I have to aim for ten minutes before I can hit something. Miss Marty grinned wickedly. Well now, Miss Jean Louise, she said, still think your father can't do anything? You still ashamed of him? No, ma'am. I don't understand. She, she puts N-O-M-E, no, 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 ma'am, I said meekly. I think I should just say no, ma'am. No, ma'am, I said meekly. Forgot to tell you the other day that besides playing the Jews harp, Atticus Finch was the deadest shot in Macomb County in his time. Dead shot, echoed Jim. That's what I said, Jim Finch. Guess you change your tune now, too. The very idea, didn't you know his nickname was Old One Shot when he was a boy? 
Why, down at the landing, when he was coming up, if he shot 15 times and hit 14 deaths, he's complained about wasting ammunition. He never said anything to me about that, Jim muttered. Never said anything about it, did he? No, ma'am. Wonder why he never goes hunting now, I said. Uh, maybe I can tell you, said Miss Maudie. If your father's anything, he's civilized in his heart. Martinship's the gift of God, a talent. Oh, you have to practice to make it perfect. But shooting's different from playing the piano or like, or the like. I think maybe he put his gun down when he realized that God had given him an unfair advantage over most living things. I guess he decided he wouldn't shoot till he had to. And he had to today. It looks like he'd be proud of it, I said. People in their right minds never take pride in their talent, said Miss Maudie. We saw Zebo drive up. He took a pitchfork from the back of the garbage truck and gingerly lifted Tim Johnson. He pitched the dog onto the truck and then poured something from a gallon jug on it and around the spot where Tim fell. Don't y'all come over here for a while, he called. And when we went home, I told Jim we'd really have something to talk about at school on Monday. And Jim turned on me. Don't say anything about it, Scowie, he said. What? I certainly am. Ain't everybody's daddy the dead a shot in Macon County. Jim said, I reckon if he wanted us to know it, he'd have told us. And if he was proud of it, he'd have told us. Well, maybe it just slipped his mind, I said. No, Scout, it's something you probably don't understand. Atticus is real old, but I wouldn't care if he couldn't do anything. I wouldn't care if he couldn't do a blessed thing. Jim picked up a rock and threw it jubilantly at the car house. Running after it, he called back, Atticus is a gentleman, just like me. My night, folks, enjoy all the way up to chapter 10. See you tomorrow.